first, so this is first law of closed systems. So I did introduction to the first law of thermodynamics. This is then the first law for closed systems. And we've got our box down the bottom. And I've closed off the, the inlets and the outlets. Inlets closed, outlets closed. And so there's no mass in and no mass out. But we see we can still have work occur on the system and we can still have heat flow across the boundary for the system. Okay, so now we just go pair it right back, make it simple. Excellent. Conservation laws, thank you, were the conservation of mass. The mass is neither created nor destroyed and energy is neither created nor destroyed. This is the first law of thermodynamics um, and we come back to it, but may change forms. Cool. The conservation of mass for a closed system is simple. I'm not, uh, I almost didn't put this up because I, it almost could be considered trivial, but I do want you to be aware, so the mass in the system at the beginning, or you know, some state, in this case M1, is the same at the mass in the system at any other state. The change in mass, delta M is always zero, and the mass rate across the boundary of the system is equal to zero. If you've got a cycle, the cycle can be closed and it can have a mass flow rate through the system, but the mass rate across a boundary will be zero because uh, the system is closed. So that's our conservation of mass sorted out. What about our conservation of energy? That's a pity. Untag. That can, sorry, that's my boss. Um, cool. Overall energy transfer, radio. So we, we said this uh, on Wednesday, so the energy transfer into and out of a system must equal the change of energy in the system. So if energy is coming into the system and nothing's going out, the energy must increase and vice versa. And we can do that on a rate basis as well. So I want to treat the, what, the left hand side and the right hand side of the equation separately. We'll simplify them, we'll bring them together um, and we'll have a first law for closed systems. So how is energy transferred into or out of a system? Okay, Energy can be transferred through heat, Q, and through work, W, and it can be transferred by mass flow. So mass coming into a system can bring energy with it. Mass exiting a system will take energy out with it. Um, and so that can be something that happens. But for a closed system, there's no energy transfer associated with mass flow. There's no mass in, no mass out. So that's nice. We can cancel that off. And we would say the energy transfer in the system is Q minus W. Q is positive if heat is coming into the system. W is positive if the system is doing work on its surroundings. So there's a sign convention to be aware of there. Um, and you'll do enough problems that you'll get to uh, get used to that. And I'll just put it in brackets, there might be many heat transfers and many works as well. So it's the summation of heat transfers and of works. In the next concepts, I want to talk about, so we'll, we'll finish this, but I want to talk about Q and W, define them a little more formally, um, and particularly W, work can come in many forms. So I need to be aware of them. So that's energy transfer into and out of the system. What about the energy in a system? All right. What are the components for us that make up the energy within a system? We mentioned last week, there's three of them. Two of them you've dealt with a lot in MN 1300, and one of them we care a lot about in thermodynamics. Internal energy is one of them, the other two? Kinetic energy and potential energy. Excellent, good, good, good. Thank you. So that's three. And we'll use U to denote internal energy. We'll think about internal energy as like thermal energy, okay? EK for kinetic and EP for um, potential. So the change of energy in a system is the sum of the, the change in those three energies, right? Um, we know what, say we take potential energy, we know what potential energy is, it's MGH. We'll use Z to denote height because H means something else. So, but change in height. So if the system, if the mass within the system is changing elevation, then 
the system, in the, the energy in the system is changing. We'll find that for most of our calculations, we'll disregard potential energy. Most of the things that we're dealing with, so for example, a gas, right, a gas, you have to lift a gas a lot, like a, a quite a large elevation to have any material change in potential energy at all. You heat a gas up a few degrees C, a few, a few Kelvin, you have a large change in thermal energy. Right? So we often disregard potential energy, and a lot of our processes are taking place in tanks, turbines, things that are nominally at the same height. You don't have large changes of, uh, of elevation. That might not be true if you're dealing with a liquid. They're more dense. You've got, larger, you've got a larger mass, potentially. Kinetic energy, coming in from the right. So kinetic energy, we know what that is. Half mv squared. In this case, it's m on 2. Uh, our final velocity minus our initial velocity. So this is talking about the change in kinetic energy. Um, for some processes, we will care about the change in kinetic energy. For many processes, we won't. We'll disregard kinetic energy, and we'll see why when we do a calculation. And then the one that we'll do all of our time on, a lot of our time on, is change in internal energy, or m times the specific change in internal energy. So lowercase here is denoting uh, specific internal energy. Uppercase is denoting total internal energy of the system. Of course, all those terms have mass in them. Yeah, go. What is the change in U? U2 minus U1? Good. It's internal thermal energy as measured in kilojoules. We measure it using temperature. So you can think of that as a temperature increase or a temperature decrease, but different substances will uh, do temperature differently, although they'll do internal energy exactly the same. So, sorry? Yes, but we'll get there. So yeah. Uh, substances don't transfer temperature between each other, they transfer energy between each other. And so we track the energy and calculate the temperature. Or we measure the temperature and calculate the energy. Um, but it's a good question, so use what we need to know. Um, mass is of course a, a common factor there between potential energy, kinetic energy and also internal energy. So we can take that out and we can find the change of energy of a system in a specific basis. And if we neglect kinetic and potential energy, which we often do, and particularly for a closed system, all right, if you've got a tank or a cylinder and something's happening in it, it's not changing height materially, it's not going quickly, um, so kinetic energy and potential energy can be disregarded, then we can say that the change in energy of a system, if we disregard potential and kinetic energy, is just the change in the thermal energy of the system. All right? This is like the exact opposite of exactly the same treatment that I know Kelman gave for 1300. I was watching his uh, video on stream, but don't tell him. It's really awkward. Um, I, he's a good lecturer, I like him. Um, right? Because he, he put up this and said, you've got thermal energy, kinetic energy, potential energy, and then said, let's disregard thermal energy and talk about how potential energy and kinetic energy relate, right? Cool, I've just done exactly the same thing, but opposite. So I said, disregard kinetic energy and potential energy, we're gonna talk about thermal energy. Um, and I'll, I, can, I can show why that, uh, that is relevant for our study. Uh, and that can be on a specific basis as well. So if you divide both sides by mass, okay? So at the top, we're talking about the energy of the total system. At the bottom, we're talking about on a specific basis. So therefore, energy transfer, okay, equals Q minus W, and delta energy of the system is delta U. And you often see delta U equals Q minus W. So I, I've swapped those around, and it can be on a specific basis as well. This is what we would say if someone said, write out the first law of thermodynamics for closed for a closed system, this is what you would write. And for the problem sets related to this, um, 
this, which, uh, um, this week's problem sets, or, or problem set two, uh, you would start with this equation and you'd do everything from that basis. So is everyone comfortable with how we've gone from something, I guess, a bit longer and more complicated, talking about energy transfer, we'll talk about the energy associated with mass flow later, that's got three terms in it as well, so the equation does get quite long, but we often pare it down and we say, well, we're interested in closed systems, we've made some assumptions about um, potential and kinetic, and so we can get something with only three terms. It's awesome. Go. Excellent. Good. So the difference is between the uppercase at the top and the lowercase at the bottom is the top properties, well, properties U, um, Q and W, are extensive, so they're total on the whole system, and the bottom are specific or intensive properties, so they're on a per mass basis. So, yeah, so you could say, um, let's put a cubic meter of water here. Cool. You could say, I'm going to put a thousand kilojoules, yeah, let's do that. Let's put a, a megajoule of energy into a cubic meter of water and see how much its temperature goes up. Okay, but I'm not going to do any work to it. Okay, so I've got a Q term, heat, right? So I've put heat into the water um, and I'm looking for a delta U and W is zero. Okay, so I've got a ton of water and putting a megajoule of energy in. Or the same problem on a, using the bottom is well, I can say, I can divide everything by mass. So I've got 1,000 kilograms of water, cubic meter of water. I've got 1,000 kilograms of water. And I've got a megajoule. Let's divide a megajoule by 1,000. So I've got a kilojoule per kilogram. If my maths is dodgy, someone pointed out. If I've got a, I'm going to put a kilojoule per kilogram of heat into the water. What's going to happen to each kilogram of water? What, how will the temperature change? Now I'm talking about kilojoules per kilogram of heat energy, and I'm talking about kilojoules per kilogram. So I've taken it down to a specific basis. So you divide the whole system by the mass to get from total to specific. It's good, which just, it's a convention for the whole subject, so I'm okay to spend a little bit of time. So I appreciate the question. Cool. Huh. So this should be trivially easy. Just give it a read. If people on the live stream would like to ask a question, I've got, or anyone in the auditorium, you don't like to put up your hand, I've got the team's lecture, live chat, and videos open on this window. And I'll occasionally glance across to it. So you can message me. But if you're in the room, put up your hand. Cool. So on a total system basis, 10 kilojoules of work is done to compress a fluid, which then transfers 4 kilojoules as, as heat to the surroundings. What is the change in internal energy delta U of the fluid? What's the sign of the 10 kilojoules? Is it work? Is it positive or negative? I heard negative. Good, yes. So it's negative. So when the system does work on the surroundings, we consider that positive work. When the surroundings do work on the system, we consider that negative work. Okay, so we get 10 kilojoules is a negative W. Transfers four kilojoules of heat to the surroundings. So is that positive or negative heat transfer? I heard negative, right? So when we are transferring heat to a system, we consider that positive. When the system is transferring heat to the surroundings, we can see that negative. So we end up saying, I'll see if this is set up to do. So we say delta U equals negative 4 kilojoules, negative, negative 10 kilojoules equals, no, no one's getting out a calculator. No. <laughs> That's fine. Um, yeah? So you say, what's the change in internal energy 
of the fluid, so it's six kilojoules. Yeah, go. My maths is wrong. <laughs> yes? That's right. Work towards the system is negative. And work towards the work from the system is positive. Work from the system is positive. Yep. And the reason for that is that when this was originally developed, they were trying to make basically the steam engine, right? So this is, this is all invented when the steam engine was um, going on. And so they were saying, we'll put heat in and we'll get work out. So heat put into the system is positive because that's what we're doing. We don't want large negative numbers right, to indicate that we're doing the right thing. So heat into the system is positive, right? And work out of the system is what we want. So that's also a positive quantity, right? So that's, um, that's where that sign convention comes from. But I don't mind intuiting it a little bit. Like you're like, you know, if you did this and you got an answer of 14, you're like, I don't feel like that's right. I don't feel like I should have added the numbers. Um, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. We're not talking about cycles, but we will get there. And I just wanted to mention something that's really cool and will become important later, um, which is in a cycle, the fluid returns back to the state that it was in at the beginning of the cycle, okay? So if I've got a cycle here, Ah, I need some labels. All right, so as you're going from state point one to state point two, you're putting work into the system. See the arrow is pointing towards the center of the cycle. Right, you're putting work into the system. Uh, and then as you go from state point two to state point three, you put heat into the system. This is an internal combustion engine. So this is an auto cycle, just for those who like to think in those terms. And then from state point three to state point four, you get work out of the system. And then from state point four to state point one, you reject heat back into the environment. You have heat lose the system, lost from the system, I'm, I'm sorry. And then when you get back to state point one, your fluid must be at the same property, has the same property values as it had at state point one, because that's the definition of a cycle. You go back to the same state point that you were at, okay? And what that means is, the net amount of heat that you put into the system, ah, oh, sorry, what that means is the cyclic integral of U is equal to zero. So U delta U over the whole cycle is zero because U can't change. And so when you sum up your Qs and you sum up your Ws, they must equal zero, which means that the net heat that you put into the system equals the net work you get out of the system. So the heat in, um, or the, the net Q equals the net W. So what we want to do to improve, if we want to improve the work out of a, a cycle, which is often our, what we're trying to optimize, what we want is work out. What we try and do is put more energy in, in step two to three, proportionally, and proportionally take less energy out in step four to one. So we have, can have an optimum system if we put lots of energy in and lose less waste heat. So just to get you thinking about cycles, we'll go there later. There's some limitations on how efficient we can go, um, and we'll get there. So that was the first law of closed systems. There's a few terms that we need to then talk about. We need to talk about heat, we need to talk about work, we should talk about internal energy and its relationship to temperature and so forth. 